Welcome to Hot Issues. What can Ghana do in the long term to resolve its energy crisis? My guest is a former boss of the Volta River Authority. Also, he set up the Ghana Institute for Public Policy Options and has done has been in energy for well over 27 years and over 40 years in the private and public life. Dr. Charles Rekubrobe is my guest on Hot Issues. Thank you very much, sir, and thank you so much for joining us on Hot Issues. Thank you. Is there any justification whatsoever for the PRC or the uh, UTT providers asking for tariff increments? There's every justification for tariff increment, but you mustn't put the horse before the cart before the horse. What you pay for, you hope is a service. You know, for the last almost four years, we've had a very curtailed service, and then we are, we're tired of the interminable song: "Pay more, and we'll give you better service." And I think what people want now especially after four years of doing so, is that, yes, we recognize that BB power from the grid and water from the mains is cheaper. So I think it is not all about payment. It's about payment, service, and quality. For example, if you take water, everybody drinks sachet water or bottled water, but by the criteria of quality, you should be able to drink tap water. You know, I, I actually grew, grew up drinking standpipe stand water. So there are three elements, the full service, the quality, and then you're paying for. I don't think anybody wants to go to the market or the supermarkets or the various mill, malls and say that, oh, here's half of what you paid for. Come back later for the other half. So the discussion ought to be firmly set in the realm of the service and the payment must come together because the arguments and the cases for pay more you get better is discredited okay uh, speaking of pay more gets better they have constantly said that currently what we're paying for does not even cover their production cost mm. and so the argument is pay realistic prices but realistic prices, what is realistic prices? Realistic is uh, a very silly word. I think I've written an article on it before. What we need is an economic tariff. What we tend to do is that we take a halfway house between realistic and economic and then provide political tariffs. Political tariffs say that all the politicians are scared when the TUC and others back won't pay X percent. And then what happens then is that the utility is squeezed in the middle because it's caught between what it actually caused them to produce the power and what the political tariff that PRC eventually gives. And that is really the, what I'm actually saying now. You know, the argument should not be about percentages. People start talking about, oh, you know, have you actually ever stopped to check how many telco units you use a week? Have you ever related that to your salary? So why is the TUC and everybody relating tariffs to salaries? And we have this historical view that are buying the others can have it for free. If you make a five minutes call on your mobile phone, you probably pay maybe three or four Ghana cities. That one will buy you 20 units of electricity. You know, so we, we really need to get this thing in perspective. It's, it's how people have cast the argument. Last week I had a, a discussion, is 80% enough? Is 20% enough? When I was VRA boss, I got 100% followed by 100%. So the argument needs to be ca cast in the realm of pay us, or, no, give us a service and we don't mind paying. And so so I, I, this whole thing about how much is enough? It's a bogus argument because we don't but, pay them well. But why is it shrouded in so much politics? Is because, because in this country, nothing moves unless it's, it's shrouded in partisan politics. Unfortunately, 
you know, I got my tariff increase under President Jay Kufo, and yet the MPP has railed against these tariff increases. The same way that um, in different times, the NDC was railing against the, the whole thing. Politicians are only interested in faking the interest of the people. Do you realize that people who, suf who suffer the most are the poorest people? Somebody, you know, when, when we went to the tariff hearings, we're, we're, we're all drinking, what do you call it, bottled water. GWCL showed that one bottle of water, the, the charge for it, was the equivalent of about six or seven drums of water piped through your house. If my pipe doesn't flow for three or four weeks and I have to buy water, the cost of that water will pay my, my water bill for the whole year of piped water. So the discussion about affordability and percentage of your salaries, every worker I know, whether it's public or private sector or the Neguja, they all buy in units more than they, they, they spend. Yes. Okay. Several times more. Okay. So the, in, in other words, if a political party is in opposition, they, send, they tend to sing towards the population. Because everything is in politics in Ghana. Okay. And so we have become accustomed to it. How do we get Not to accustomed to it. I think it's, 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 it's a level of irresponsible behavior which is pulling this country back. And this is why this country, after 60 years, after being Ghana, Africa's first independent country, is being pulled back. Because the whole game is about gaining political power so that you can gain access to whatever. You know, it is not about looking after the people's welfare. It is not about doing things, you know, that we all recognize. Everything in this country we, we are partisan about. Okay. And that is really not acceptable. Okay. Over the weekend, Dr. K.B. Asante mm. mentioned that governments must tell the truth to the populace. Government do, do, must always tell the truth to the populace. Do, do, can they handle it? Or when is it okay for governments to I just said I had a 100% tariff increase in two successive years. Do you know how I did it? I assembled a whole lot of your colleagues in the Akuse, and I spoke to them for five hours so they understood so it was like Jesus. They carried my message. You understand? These tariffs, you just get low-level technical people who come and talk technical language. But if you put if if you put it in a stark language, that two sachets of no for water, which is what I call sachet water, <laughs> that's 40 pence. You know, that's equivalent to the same cost. Or you have to buy about 400 of it you know, for the thousand gallons of water that GWCL is trying to charge you four cities for. You have to put all of these things in language that you and I understand. That the, as the Ghanaians would say, the ordinary Ghanaian understands. You understand? So, this is the issue. We don't want to talk about long term. You know, let's solve the problem now. The problem at hand is that we've lived in doing so for four years. Unfortunately, you know what? will happen with KB at this thing. If you don't solve the problem, people will charge you. They will go and vote you out. So you might as well tell them the truth, give them the service, recognize that they are getting the service. You know, I recognize that for about a year now I haven't bought water. So I'm satisfied that the water service has improved. I recognize that the bill I pay for water is equivalent to two tanker levels before. Okay. That is the message you should go, but I'm just saying that every year, the utilities and PRC, see PRC is supposed to look after uh, the financial integrity of the utilities as well as the consumer interest. Whenever you hear tariff increases, it is always about the percentage increase, not about the quality of service, not about the uh, reliability of the service. Do you realize that I came here 27 years ago from you know, my walkabout, and GWCL used to lose in a technical sense. They did not collect money for 50% of the water they produce. 
that situation is still today. Just think what will happen if they actually collected money for even 30%. It means we are paying for inefficiency of GWCL. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to the PRC, but with the current crisis at hand, are we contracting the right personnel, the expert to manage it well, so we can get out of this? No, we are contracting. We look, like, you see, I keep saying to people, when I was at VRA chief executive, the dam was at its lowest level since 1983. We didn't have doom so. And do you know who my chief manager was? He was called K. Kofi. All governments want to interfere in the day-to-day -day running of utilities. You know, which business will survive if you use $500 million of electricity and don't pay for it? That's what the government and the MMDAs have done. When they cut off electricity to Koforia and Kumasi, do you know what they did? They went and found money to buy uh, fuel, uh, gas oil to put in their generators. That money would have been better spent buying easy. But you know why? It's the mentality. It's a buying uh, broke. And the politicians feed into it. We have the people at heart. Oh, as for us, we are carrying government. So, oh, you won't pay this. And we too, we like, we are, we are entitlement society. You see? So, there is a lack of reality in everything that happens. But I can tell you that the technical, technical people are the best you can get because I worked with them and we avoided you know, but at the time you know we had to also go and say okay if the consumers have paid the tariff then we should make sure that there is no cut in supply okay. right so that, that's a quick report okay. the issue about do so um, the, the energy the power minister says that by the end of the year he will resign and uh, Dr. Kovner I, I hope he doesn't and, have to uh, resign. Yes, so and so a lot of people are looking forward to that. No, no don't, don't look forward to it. <laughs> to, no, to, uh, to, uh, to an end to the doom so, not necessarily his resignation. Because Let's deal with it. Yeah, that, yes, that's what we need to deal with. Okay. You see, that's why I have uh, done my research and provided numbers of what we need to produce to end the doom so. You know, the government makes the mistake. And somebody is, is advising not just this government, but previous government. We are going to add megawatts. Like the power badges? We are going, no, but, no, yes, that's, that's adding megawatts. But any time a politician gets up, they go and say, we'll have 5,000 megawatts by the end of so and so. <laughs> well, if you have 5,000 megawatts and you don't have fuel to run the 5,000 megawatts, you won't have energy. You won't have power. You will not believe this. Every president, you know, President Kufo, President Mahama, I have personally said, stop talking about megawatts. Let's talk about energy. Energy equals power. Megawatts are important. But if you want to go from here to Cape Coast or from here to Kumasi, and we have bought a Super V8 or the uh, Tuareg that the ladies like, if there's no fuel in it, it would never leave Accra to get to Kumasi. So there is a combination of megawatts, megawatts and fuel. So if you start owning everybody, owning uh, the Nigerians for fuel, owning the Ghana gas for fuel, uh, owning God because he hasn't fuel like Kosovo Dam, you don't have fuel. And you keep telling people, singing the song, I'm adding megawatts. It doesn't deliver power on its own. So, the whole thing has to be, how do we end with doom so? I am arguing that if the power bodies had come at a time that they, they had come, yeah. they, were, they were intended, they would have made some contribution. Do you know why? Because at that time, virtually all our generation capacity were facing challenges. The dam was down with water. Takrari and Tema and a few other places were actually not working, the thermal plants. We didn't, uh, we had started building but not completed some, you know, some of the projects that Kufo contracted but didn't build. 
The situation now is that all our capacity, the thermal ones, are up. So even though the, 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 the lake is low, we have enough thermal you know, capacity in combination about the lake producing about some. That is why I homed in on a number that VRA alone can produce 70% of our energy needs for, for next year. If you add that, if you then add other thermal plants which are already in the system, Senate, Asogli, which produces a lot, uh, Senate, uh, then there is little, little, uh, what do you call, Siemens and all those kind of things. Then those plants, added to what VRA can produce, can deliver the required energy for the whole of next year. So, uh, car power for the immediate uh, need is passed to sell by date. But at any rate, you see, you start a journey before you arrive. So, it is ludicrous for Ghanaians to sit there and be fed this diet of it will arrive tomorrow when it doesn't even left the port. You understand? The car power she was not left Turkey. And yet, keep it, keep, people keep postponing the date. So let's wait until we, somebody can say to us, on this day, from the port of Ankara, car power ship A, B, and Z, Ghana, left. Then we can all go on the net and follow the maritime chart and say, ah, true, it shall arrive on such and such a date. Until then, we should just put but it aside. I mean, even if it leaves port, so, and gets here, it, it's bringing just about 125 megawatts? Two, 225. 225. Yeah. Megawatts. Uh, will that bring any? It's form not. Of no, it's not. No, no, no. Please understand what I'm saying. For now, it is not part of the equation, and that was the the reason why it was irritating when the resolution of our power problem was being equated with the arrival date of car power. No, car power may have some future use. If, for example, we don't want do so do so to return in four or five years' time or two or three years' time. That may have some use. But let's talk about car power when it actually arrives. When did you see a Philly Philly, as we say in Ghana? The washing pot issues. We're taking a break. We'll be right back to talk more about the electricity company of Ghana, the management of electricity, and how Ghanaians' owning share could be a turning point. <laughs> talked about privatization, but it has to do with the distribution of power. How does going public, inviting Ghanaians to buy share in it, will change the fortunes of the ECG? I, um, I grew up with Kwame Nkrumah era, the great socialist there. I was a young pioneer, they called it. Like that, like that. So the only thing, the one of the big legacies Kwame Nkrumah left us is that state assets as we call it, strategic or family heirloom. So whether it is badly run or not, we have a love or abhorrence of state-owned institutions being privatized. So as soon as governments signed the agreement with the Americans, we said that the management is poor, although that's debatable, or to what extent is poor, we don't know. So we'll give you money, but in return, you hand over the running of ECG to a privatized company. No, Ghanaians were not worried about all the problems they get with ECG. Their worry was, hey, are you going to privatize ECG? Why? It belongs to Ghanaians. Now my attitude is really, I want good service for the money. But at the, at the same stage, I can understand that Ghana having made so much by way of investment, you know, it, it hurts that if like the gravy is going to be earned by somebody else or taken away by somebody else. So that I, that's why I argue that let's separate ownership from management. Ownership, if we want to own ECG, fine. When I lived in Britain, when Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister, 
she privatized a whole lot of state-owned institutions, and she said, but I want the shares to go to everybody, every Britain. I want every Britain to become a share owner. So there were restrictions placed on the amount of shares, and you know, the bottom line is that when it was all done, share ownership in Britain had moved from 14% to about 70% of the population. If we are so hang on not selling our assets, we have a stock market. If you go and look at the stock market, it's full of beer producers and premium sellers. <laughs> Why don't we put a lot of our production there? Why don't Ghanaians put their, literally their money where their mouth is? Go and buy shares. And then, when you are a share owner, you know what you look for? The best quality of service, the best revenue from your customers, and then the best, what do you call it, uh, profit or your uh, dividend. You get the best of three worlds. A well-run ECG means that they will sell more power, means that customers will be more satisfied, means that people will come and maybe invest, uh, build their factories here and create jobs. And we Ghanaians who own ECG, the dividends we shall share and go and drink more beer. You see, so let's separate the ownership from the fact that there are limitations to how the management of ECG has gone and that if we can get better managers, better people to come and run ECG, and provide with us with improved service, it doesn't matter. It's like a, you have TV3. Huh? TV3 has got the shareholders, those who own it, separate from the board of directors, you know, led by my own boss, separate from your CEO, separate from all you people who make the money. If you are in a, inefficient, the CEO will write a letter to you that you are inefficient. You see? So that's all we are I'm proposing, that let the debate move from the emotional, ideological to the practical reality. Everybody's got complaints about ECG. But again, you shouldn't be unfair to them. Part of the condition we've signed on to is that the $500 million that government owes ECG, they will pay before this arrangement starts, and before the American money comes. So you ask yourself, why? Is the white man better than us? Why are you making it soft for them? Why don't you pay ECG their money now? Then then we can see whether the Ghanaian says, aha, if you have given me my money, I would have done better. It's debatable whether they would have done better. But it's arguable. So, but why are we afraid then? Afraid of what? Afraid of uh, allowing Ghanaians privatize because people get emotional and they don't want to hear about privatization of ECG. Because privatization always equals foreign ownership. That is why people are upset. You know, the, the privatization doesn't say, Tazan, go and go and buy ECG because it knows that Tazan, who is reputed the richest man in Ghana, even he cannot buy ECG or he cannot provide the level of investment that you know. So the emotion is not about privatization, but it's about sale to foreign, of, of our beloved assets to foreign owners. That's what I'm saying. Let's deal with the ownership. Let's, uh, all of us, all Ghanaians, open it out. Make share ownership, maybe take the cities, go and buy it. Raise the capital ECG needs. And then, if I know that I'm a part owner of ECG, and I want to get the best service and the best dividend, I will say, go look for the best management. Whether it is Ghanaian or from abroad, a combination of the two, the, the ownership has remained here. The Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, what is wrong with the approach? What is wrong with, is there anything wrong with the way they're going about uh, something for... Very, public? very wrong. First of all, they should have published the submissions in the national press, so that the people will read it ahead of their hearings. You know, you go to these hearings, three quarters of the time is taken up by the utilities giving their case, and you know, and then you are supposed to react to it. All your reaction is that, oh, it's too much in here. <laughs> Don't get any time to really, you know, so that's the first thing. Second, as I said, there's so much emphasis on the percentage increase. 
I have never been to any uh, PURC hearing where the, it starts with we the PURC assure you that these tariff proposals or the decision we take on the tariff will not apply until doing so is finished. That is what I would like to see. Always you hear, if you pay this, then we think we can do that. In 2013, after the tariff increases, actually, you know, was sitting in the chair like yours, and I asked the chief executive of VRE, so when we pay the tariff tomorrow, we'll, we'll, we'll do something? And he said, no. He was very candid. I was then. Then I asked the ECG person also in the program, oh, so what can you promise us by way of better quality? He started cataloging all the problems that would not allow him to give us better quality. You see what I'm saying? So, that is what I'm saying. And that is what I'm saying. The two must go together. The end of doing so and the application of new tariffs, one should not precede the other. You know, the chicken before argument is lost its credit. Chicken before the egg is lost its credit. Okay? I don't know. Maybe... God needs to create a chicken and an egg so it comes at the same time. <laughs> no. But we can't have this pay more and then we'll give you better service. Because there's no guarantee. Because people have paid more. There's debt all over. There's inefficiencies all over. Nobody's talking about that. But if you look at the obligations of, of the PURC, consumer interest is number one. On this own website, go and read it. But it has taken the financial viability of the utilities to a ridiculous level. In any other private sector and private company, ECG and VR and others would have uh, been liquidated by now. But we are dealing with a public monopoly. You know, a public monopoly, which is unchallenged. So I think PURC's approach is wrong, and I, it's unfortunate also that President Mahama is following the presidents of previous presidents by saying you must pay more. If an independent organization set up under the constitution is to hear arguments, cases, look at the numbers, it says they must look uh, at generation mix, they must look at uh, exchange rates, they must look at you know, their actual things. And then you go around saying, you must pay more. Are they independent? What is their, their point? And it's not just him. All the previous ones did the same. You know, th there is this in incredible disrespect or power meaning of African politicians that make them not respect independent institutions and the work that independent institutions are supposed to do. You know, so now we just see PURC as a president's poodle. The president has said tariffs must go up, so they will go up. But Ghanaians will complain, and when you say, come and sign the petition, they will run away. I recently said, oh, you don't like TV license fee, come and sign the petition. <laughs> They've all run away. The Alliance for Accountable Governance, for instance. Please, I don't want to talk about that. No, no. They're, they're talking about the PURC mm -hmm. and that they intend to pick it. I mean, solicit the views of other Ghanaians to go there. What can, not just a group like the pressure group like that, but what can Ghanaians as individuals do to let their voices be heard that until do, 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 do quality you know, of no, service you know, improves, do, do you know what they I will think? not pay? No. Do you know what I think? All of these things, they don't mean anything. That's all protests, we've heard them and all of that. Um, what I would suggest for Ghanaians is that the brilliant lawyers who also pay tariffs, they should institute what is called, in legal terms, a class action. Somebody should go to court and test the law to see that whether we should pay any tariffs at all without the full service. And, and actually, hopefully, get the court to decide that no end to do so, no tariff increase. We don't know whether we will succeed or not. But at least go and test the law. And by class action, maybe Kwasi Apenyi will take his name there 
and expect Beth and all these people you, you come along with to also join their name to the class action. That we, we also, not only do we talk basa basa, we support and we are part. You know, you remember the, uh, what do you call it, election petition, when several people were to, wanted to join. That's a class action. But I think the demonstration, you know, sometimes it almost become like we demonstrate for his sake. And I'm talking as the organizer of the largest demonstrations in Ghana, the Kumi Prego marches. So if you organize and you are not going to have an effect, if at the end of the demonstration we go and talk about how well we did and what numbers <laughs> turned out and we still got a uh, tariff increase, did we go or did we come out here? <laughs> so so I, 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 I really want to see concrete action. You know, um, everybody, well, I think everybody, about 80 or 90 percent, didn't want to pay TV license fee. They still don't. Exactly. But the point is that if you don't like a law in a democracy, you ask for the law to be changed. That was the purpose of the petition. But the money I've spent is to do that action. I could have bought. TV license fee for 20 nice young ladies <laughs> or more. But then you don't get it. People ask you, oh, so how's the petition going? And my return is, have you signed? Oh, no. <laughs> so so we're not making an impact with demonstrations, public mm. protests. Unless you have a really course. massive demonstration of the type of the original Kubi Prakwani's follow up in Kumasi, which forced government to drop what? There must be a purpose. So, if the, the the purpose is not achieved, but I'm just saying that we have never tested the law as to whether we should be paying tariffs when we are not even getting the service. And the, unfortunately, the independent organization is silent on that matter. That is my beef with PRC, and I was one of the people who helped set it up in '97. You know. As an independent, but when PRC is effective, as it was when I was chief executive, it didn't listen to politicians. It granted two successive 100% increases. That put pressure on us to make sure that we delivered. So, why has PRC become so dependent on government then? Hey, please. The executive <laughs> secretary is called Samuel Sapon. And the director of consumer affairs is called Nanaya. So you can talk to me. <laughs> no, but, but we, we must get out of this issue now. Because yeah, consumers that, are not... Are, are but not that is the point I'm making. There must be a quid pro quo. That is why I talked about the Siamese twins. Yes, yes. You can't you know, have one... And I have twins, by the way. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not Siamese. But you can't have one from the other. You know, increased tariffs should come with full service. So I've seen that the president is now running away from his commitment to end doom so by saying, oh, you now need to pay a more tariff so we can end doom so. so. He can't get away with that. Oh, boy. You want the end of doom so, doom so. You see, and government can do something. As I speak to you, VRA is owned about 1.3 billion cities or, or, or dollars. Uh, ECG is down. Crypto is down. So even if you get a tariff increase today, they will not be able to, you know... So somebody has to plug the gap. Government must find money to, one, pay his debts and provide working capital for these uh, utilities so that revenues... so that we can pay more, so the revenues from that will then be there. There are certain issues that we should also discuss. You know, like for example, when I first came, uh, at that time I was uh, very socialist <laughs> in my thinking. And we, uh, we started an extension of electricity in 1989, the one that every, every political party wants to claim. And we decided that, look, if there's no point giving people access to electricity if they cannot pay for it. So we started what was called a lifeline tariff. That 
has lost its meaning now. Because if you live in a compound house and your landlord is deciding how much you should pay, lifeline tariff, you would never enjoy it. The lifeline tariff is of 50 units. If there's like a typical Kumasi Ashanti Rita house of maybe 50 families, they, they, they will never get it. Meanwhile, me sitting here in my nice house, I get lifeline tariff free. So we need to change all that stuff and maybe look at if we want to target poor people, we should either give them a subsidy or in, in voucher equivalent or something. So that's one way which you can shift the whole burden of, of these things away from, you know, government paying, because a lifeline tariff is paid by government to the utilities. I think we heard of Fuzukaji talking about it yesterday. You know, so that if people will stop pretending, if people will get away from the campaign mode, if people can actually, you see, the reason politicians uh, uh, are afraid to talk is that you can always play them back what they said five years before when they were singing the, the other hymn. But me, I have been singing and talking and making noise for nearly 30 years. Nobody will say that you said this and you are saying something different now. That is what you want. Be level with the people. Be level with the people. The president has been my friend ever since I came here. Because at the time, he was working for the Japanese embassy and we wanted to get money from them to do electrification. So, but I will tell him, as I've told him, if doing so, doing so is not finished, it will end it. No amount of classrooms will let him be there. Okay. We'll take a break on hot issues. We're back at to wrap up, uh, probably look at uh, government paying its own bills. How will that resolve or make easy the problems of the energy sector? Welcome back to Hot Issue. Uh, talk. A lot of people have said, okay, government must be seen to be paying its own bills. Uh, the ministries should have prepaid meters. We were, supp we were supposed to start that, have them... Five years uh, ago. Yes. Uh, realistically, if we're supposed to do that, how much of it will ease the pressure on government itself in paying all these? <coughs> Not just the government. Well, let's, let's go. If government pays the bills, yes. it will get quite a lot of political capital because... I don't know if you've ever played a game called Dominoes. Yes. Uh -huh. Dominoes, yes. <laughs> so you push the first one, and then you, it pushes the other one. So $520 million is paid to ECG. ECG is able to pay Asogli. Asogli is able to pay VRA. VRA is able to settle the Nigerians. And then Ghana Gas also gets some money. Can you, can you, can you see that? Just the commitment that the government has made to the Millennium Development Authority to pay all of ECG's bills before the compact can start delivering, do we need that to understand that we have consumed and we must pay ECG and it's really viable? So the dominoes will start off with either you, you have the money or you can go, you know, our answer to everything is to go and issue bonds. That's why you are most epic now. You know, but when they borrowed money to build a flyover, when 80% of Ghanaians travel by foot or taxis or daughter, let us get that problem. Me, I'm not running a political office. I feel when I run a political office. Yeah. But the issue is that those running for political office, the incumbent, when people go to vote, they will say that, you know, and I've seen, I don't know if you've seen, there's a, a publication, it's a catalog of dates of how many promises the, pre the president <laughs> has made about ending the so. <laughs> you can be sure that, that that list will resurface. 
the internet never forgets. You see, and people think that it's us, middle class and posh people who talk. No. The barbers have lost their business. The pure water people are losing their business. You know? So it's not just uh, we like, we uh, LCD TV people who are, who are talking. Businesses are closing down. You see, we are, again in this country, we have this notion that government must employ everybody. It's not possible. In every, 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 every country that's successful, the bulk of the employment is in the private sector. We all can be government employees. We have got more civil servants than Britain, whose GDP is about 100 times our own. And when we get into problems of managing our economy, all people are talk, talked about is workers are being laid off. I worry about workers being laid off in the private sector. Because you find the public sector, what is happening? All these people who are get, getting paid late. They are getting paid late because some public servant is not doing their work. You know, so let's get real. That will be a subject of another conversation. <laughs> but in the power sector, you know, what we need is to make a state-owned organization as efficient as, you know. Yesterday, I was reading a story. Uh, I heard a story. We were saying that we have to import pineapples and mango from Ivory yes. Coast and Brazil. And because we have Those two season. countries are in the same tropical belt as us. We have had established in this country an irrigation development authority which is as old as VRE. 60 years on, we rely on rainfed agriculture. Are we mad? Yes, I, I mean, the company that mentioned that said they spend about $250,000 a week. The, is, the issue I'm raising, you know, if I was them, I would go to Ivory Coast. Because irrigated farms can produce your pineapple all year round. If they go to Ivory Coast, 3,000 jobs gone. It's the private sector that every politician gets up and says is the engine of growth. And they never put any petrol in the engine. It's like having megawatts without gas to run your power plant. Doc, do you worry about the trend now where you have school of hygiene nurses and the like picketing saying that, that the they point, have finished the point, school? That is the point I'm making. You know, we need people. They finish school. They, you know, school of hygiene. You have you have doctors. You know, who feel that when they become doctors, they they, they become dramatic. yeah. They should not rely on their parents for chalk money and things. And they have to come and pick it to get their own salary. In that time, they are picketing if ten people. That what will we say? You know, it means that somebody is not doing their job down the line because somebody is to make sure that they put the person's you know people's name. On the register, whatever, etc. But then we are diverting from energy. So <laughs> no, um, and Doc, the WACO held yeah. a press conference uh, last week uh, threatening to cut gas supply to Ghana. Uh, for some, the public, the press conference should not have come on. No, you see, <laughs> I started the discussion, I'm sure you know. It's between the devil and the deep blue sea. A notice had been given. In fact, if you go back, you find that two months ago or more, sure. the president had told PURC to sort out WAPCO's problems. We were not sorted out. But WAPCO is only a gas carrier. WAPCO is not a gas supplier. The supplier says, Mother, you made me a promise that you do A, B, C, D. You have not done it. So I'm instructing WAPCO to shut down the gas from such a certain day. Which would you have preferred? Got Wabco to say nothing and then one day you sit there and the whole country is in darkness. Or Wabco to tell the whole nation about it that the deadline is coming on. But the pity was the government trying to deny that the problem existed. Because the press were naturally worried, so everybody is going to WAPCO, you know. And in the absence of information, 
in the absence of people claiming, or the Minister of Power say, go and talk to Ghana Gas, or I don't know if I haven't bought any gas. Don't you think that would have caused more panic? They didn't even have to get to a point where we had to send a whole delegation to speak you know, on Ghana's behalf, or to intervene on government's behalf. Did he intervene? To plead? Yeah. Okay. That we we'll let our yes be yes. The problem hasn't gone away. It's been kicked to touch. And that has been reported in the press. You know, if by February it's not all sorted, can you imagine in an election year, return of Jumso, I will be for my brother Mahama. So, somebody has to solve, sort it out. But we, we have had this relationship with them for a while. Should I tell you a secret? Mm-hmm. I signed a contract with Engas that got the pipeline built. There was a long time when they were not honoring what they should be doing. And I kept saying to people, sue these people. Because the gas that was supposed to uh, bring us relief from the use of oil and make it all, they were not delivering. But kind of we are nice. And then when they put the squeeze on us, they would say, oh, but you will be nice to you. They don't work like that. They don't work like that. There's been a whole series of problems with the, the gas pipeline. But we should have taken action when it was taken. But you see, again, 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 instead of dealing with the reality, People start talking about when uh, uh, ENI gas will come, when this will happen. Let's deal with the, the, the now. now problems, as I call them. Not tomorrow. Let's deal with the now problems. Let's get Ghana back to work. Now. Okay. You know, because you can talk to 2017. You may, you may or may not be in yeah. power. It's like a fake 40 year development plan. <laughs> Even you may not be alive. <laughs> Dr. Charles Rekubo, thank you so much for joining us. A very big thank you to Dr. Charles Rekubrobe for joining us on Hot Issues. My name is Bridget Otu and I sat in for your regular host, Kwesi Pratt.